Hi everyone, Ollie here. Welcome back to the channel. This is going to be the diary video for week six of the grad entry program year two at Warwick Medical School. It's actually been another pretty interesting week as they all tend to be at medical school. Just a quick reminder before I go anywhere that I'm still running my giveaway of the Modern Medical Student Manual by Dr. Chris Lovejoy. Absolutely essential reading for any medical student or future medical student. Um, has lots of tips on how to study effectively, how to make the most of your time at medical school and how to become a successful doctor afterwards. How to make your mark on medicine, that's the tagline. There are two ways to enter the giveaway. Either you leave a comment on the giveaway video on YouTube or you find the post on Instagram that's linked in the description of this video and leave me a comment on there. That will close midnight the 31st of October and I will draw one winner from the entire entry pool but that does mean that by commenting on both the Instagram post and the YouTube video, both of them in the description, you can get yourself two entries and double your chances of winning. So Monday I was back in at George Elliott Hospital. We do one day a week on clinical placement in AC1 which is uh, the first few months of year two and I was with the outpatient clinics. First thing in the morning, I got to sit in with an inflammatory bowel disease clinic. So that was talking to people who had uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, kind of autoimmune disorders that affect the digestive system in different parts. And that was really good, I think, because block one, uh, actually looking back, I really, really enjoyed. So that was sort of abdominal viscera, um, anatomy, physiology of the digestive system, the liver, spleen, pancreas. It was really good revision for me. I've not done any gastro in quite a long time, but I was nicely surprised how much of it, uh, including the relevant pharmacology, I remembered. Uh, so a lot of those patients were on a drug called infliximab, I think it's also called Remicade, or something similar to that in the US, and that basically stops uh, a chemical messenger, a cytokine called TNF, tumor necrosis factor alpha, from entering cells. It's quite complicated, but basically the way it works is it stops the cascade um, of protein changes that happen in rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not actually sure how, um, how infliximab works in Crohn's disease, but my best guess is it's going to stop some part of that reaction cascade pathway, uh, which will then stop that autoimmune damage of the bowel. But the thing that was really interesting about that clinic was that in every single case, so all the patients that I saw, uh, whether it was ulcerative colitis, or whether it was Crohn's disease, their condition was really well controlled with medication. They had no complaints about the drugs. Pentaza um, was the other one they were taking, which I think is mesalazine. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. But, but those autoimmune conditions, so things like uh, Crohn's disease, lupus, I think all of them have a tendency to flare up or become worse with stress. And what had happened in every case was that the patients had come in with something social that was stressing them and then that had exacerbated their symptoms so it wasn't it wasn't like the disease as such it was something social socio-psychological that was happening to them in their lives that was stressing them that was causing the symptoms so a lot of what happened in the clinic was was just talking to them about their problems and how uh, how they think they might be able to solve them for themselves because the medication um, was sort of working, you know, as best as it could and it was controlling them most of the time. It was just these new flare-ups. So it's just one of those cases where it's a bit more about like life management and treating the patient holistically and looking into all the options available. Later on in the morning, something interesting happened as well, not in the same clinic, but um, elsewhere in the hospital. Uh, I was speaking to a patient and they started talking about um, holistic treatments and uh, basically alternative therapies, what I would call alternative therapy. Um, I should probably get this out of the way. I'm not sure whether I've talked about this on this channel or not. I completely do not buy into alternative therapies, homeopathy, prayer therapy, magic crystals, None of it works, it's all a waste of time. But the, the real kind of conundrum that I, I got thinking about was if you are a, a, a doctor, say, or a nurse, or, or some um, clinical staff, and the patient starts uh, going down these lines, particularly if they want to come off any existing medication that they're on in favor of these new things they've found and they think are working, it was, 
how far do you go in your dismissal of that sort of thing? Because if you just sort of, I feel like if you go, you're being scammed, stop wasting your money, these pills aren't doing anything, the patient is just going to shut down immediately and not be receptive to the other things you say, which might actually be important. Um, and, you know, that's something I'd like you guys, if you've ever had an experience like that or have any strong thoughts uh, one way or the other. Um, in terms of clinical professionals, where do you think that line is as to how much you should say? Should you just let them get on with it if it's not obviously harming them? Do you think, as someone who is meant to be educated about these things, do you say, you know, look, in my professional capacity, I don't think this is a good idea? What do you think? Then that afternoon I spent with an F2 doctor for bedside teaching. So I have uh, five sessions of what's called bedside teaching during AC1. I've had three of them now. And what that means is we follow a doctor, uh, it could be a junior doctor or a consultant or a reg, um, on the wards. They find patients for us to talk to that usually have some interesting presentation and then they'll watch us take a history and then perform a focused exam on that patient. But what was really nice about this one was that it was a, a relatively new F2. Um, she was really lovely and with F1s and F2s particularly, what's nice about being around them is that they're they're like the closest thing, or they are doctors, they're the closest to, they're the closest thing to us as medical students and, and they're doctors, but they've still got so long to go in their own careers. That's the nice thing. They're, they're like the next stage. Well, I guess there's there's us, then there's final year medical students, which I guess are a stage of their own. And then there's F1s and F2s, which are, yeah, the next step on from being a medical student. So it's always nice to spend time around them. Tuesday, I didn't write an awful lot in my blog, which wasn't very helpful. But what we did focus on in our SSC, which is on medical education, uh, was talking about the steps involved and the progression of things that you do when it comes to teaching. For that session, we all had to bring a clinical skill uh, that could be taught in one or two minutes and we had to teach someone else in the class, just in little partners. The challenge of it was kind of thinking through why and how you were doing it. So I, I chose to do percussion, um, the sort of tapping on a patient who might be on their abdomen or their um, their thorax or something to elicit a percussion note and it might be dull or resonant but it allows you to check for maybe enlarged organs or uh, fluid or masses that shouldn't be there things like that it's a really quick um, thing that you use in a lot of focused exams and it's really simple um, I can I don't know whether you can hear that or not but I'm sort of tapping my knuckle you're trying to elicit a, a note of some sort and I was teaching this to one of my colleagues who was himself a nurse um, so it was nothing new to him but it really got me thinking about you know what what's the best logical order to teach something like this in how much information do I give beforehand do I tell them what it's for what percussion is for like I've just done with you guys or do I wait until after I've shown them how to do it before I tell them that or do I see if they can work it out how much knowledge do I assume the person I'm teaching has how can I assess that they're doing it properly? There's all these little questions that um, that do come out of it. And just moments like that make me really glad that I've taken the SSC. It is a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. But in terms of improving my own teaching technique, I think there's a lot you can take away from the sessions. Then in the evening, we taught a seminar um, with our first year students which is always really nice, and I was teaching vertebral levels, anatomical planes and vertebral levels. So the planes, um, what I mean is like if you were to cut a line across one of these axes, so we can either go sort of through me in the sagittal plane and you'd be looking at the sort of side chopped through like that, we could go through me like this and that would be a transverse or axial slice, and then we could go this way kind of horizontally through my head if you can see that and that would be a coronal slice so those are the three major axes on which you can do anatomical slices and vertebral levels what that essentially means if you're unfamiliar is the the vertebrae in your spine that particular organs or features in your body uh, match up with and that's part of a discipline called surface anatomy 
without looking inside someone, you can assume from where their vertebrae are roughly where you might find certain organs and structures. So for example, the, um, the sternal angle, the sort of bit where your, your sternum dips downwards, that usually sits around T4, T5, so your fourth and fifth thoracic uh, vertebrae. You might have the celiac trunk, which supplies most of the foregut. Uh, that sits around T12 usually, and then the superior mesenteric artery, which supplies the midgut. You're talking L1, so just one vertebrae lower. They're a bit abstract if you've not seen them before, but when you're looking for certain things or working out what anatomical structures could be impinged by nerve damage or masses or ischemia, knowledge of where things sit is really important. Wednesday I did an enormous bulk cook. Um, I had a load of food arrive on the Tuesday but I, I got three whole chickens. Just I'm going to talk about food for a couple of minutes because um, I've started meal prepping a lot which you may have noticed if you follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram, Postgrad Medic, it's a great time. Uh, so I prepare two or three weeks worth of meals in advance and I really recommend it because it saves so much time in your day. You will spend maybe an afternoon cooking, um, so I was cooking and butchering these chickens and doing a load of rice and vegetables and things, but you only have to do that once and then you don't have to do it again for like three weeks uh, if you do it right, which is so, so nice. It saves so much time in my day that I can then use for other things. And it's cheaper as well because if I buy chickens, for example, whole chickens, which are often reduced instead of just buying already butchered uh, breast or leg meat, I can use the entire thing, cook it, remove all the meat, put it in a big tub, use it to make whatever I could make, fajitas or curry, or I put it in a paella before. Anyway, that's enough about food because Thursday was the big night of the year. Thursday was doctors and nurses. Now, I think medics have a bit of a reputation for partying hard. Basically, they don't get much time to party, so when they do, they go all out. Doctors and Nurses is kind of the epitome of that. It's the big yearly event um, at Warwick Medical School, so what basically happens is, and think of this what you will, I'm just reporting what happens, but the guys dress up as kind of the sexiest nurses they can, usually complete with some sort of facial hair. And then the girls will tend to dress up in scrubs and stethoscopes and put like male facial hair on. It's a bit stereotypical. It's a fun evening. And it's really funny to see everyone dressed up and people go all out on these costumes. <laughs> so that all goes down uh, at a club called Casbah in Coventry. And this year, which was a new fun experience um, because it's mostly first, second and third years and some finalists that go, like the entire medical school convenes for this thing. Um, I was sat in the kind of entrance to the club just waiting for my housemates to come out and this was maybe two, half past two when we were preparing to go home. The first years had the uh, anatomy day at 8 a.m. the following morning, so heaven help them. But uh, as I was sat on, kind of on the steps in the bit outside, um, quite a few first years in a very drunken state came up and was sort of oh I, I love your videos they were really helpful and that was very very funny but actually having done the videos and having people already know who you are without having to do the kind of uh, awkward introductions is a really nice barrier breaker because there just is no barrier so people will happily come up and just say hi and that's genuinely been a really nice experience it's been very positive and then because I'm an idiot and I don't think far in advance, uh, I'd actually given myself a 9am meeting the following morning, so I got very, very little sleep. But that brings me to the other kind of big thing that's going on right now, which is this uh, MMI day, because I'm, I can't remember how much I've said before, but basically we're putting on a free multiple mini interview prep day targeted at disadvantaged postcode schools in the Coventry and Warwickshire area, that is to say those schools uh, that fall under the university's widening participation scheme. It's been a lot, a lot of work. Um, I'm still kind of, we're still getting sponsors together but they're coming in. We've got a ton of volunteers, we've got staff interested in helping out as well. We've got students uh, writing to me from other medical schools um, asking to come and help and what this what this is all kind of leading to and what I've had to do now 
I realized um, a while ago that because I, I was offering to do the free interviews on this channel and a great many of you I've done those with, I think I've done about 50 now, um, and been able to get feedback to most of you but not all, sadly sometimes it logistically hasn't been possible. That needed spinning out. So what I'm doing, uh, or I'm in the process of doing, is setting up a new website which is going to have a new social media presence and a new YouTube channel uh, and all this. This, so that website is going to basically become this project and then the MMI day is going to fall under the purview of that project and I think that's a great way to make sure that both are long term sustainable. So what, what the website quickly is going to be volunteer run, um, myself and a few of my colleagues here at the med school are setting it up and getting it going where you can email in, request an interview slot and it will be done by one of our volunteers. We will have a set set of resources that everyone use or everyone will have access to. Obviously we'll still try to tailor things as much as we can but it's going to be the same as I always did it. It's going to be free, it's going to be tailored, you're going to get feedback from medical students there's going to be no cost to the end user but because we are going to set up a team of volunteers and please message me if you're interested if you're a medical student or a doctor maybe if you're watching and you want to get in part and join the team please do message me because I'm trying to take this as far and wide as I can and match people that are suitable uh, with one another. So having that team will allow us to deal with far more. We'll be able to do personal statement reviews, um, do the interviews much more closely tailored because we'll have more time between us and it'll allow us to coordinate larger scale events as well. We're also in the process of setting up a student magazine um, here at the med school, which I'm going to be editing the first issue of, uh, which I'm really excited about. Loads of people have been in touch. Uh, with topics they want to write about, things they feel passionately about, but I need to stop rambling. There's just, there's such a lot going on. I'm getting up super early at the moment to kind of deal with it all. But this is very much what I love to do. I feel very much in my element when things are like whirling about all over the place and there's a million tasks to do and not enough time to do them. But it's great. I'm really excited. And there are more interviews coming for this channel as well. More of my colleagues on the course are saying they're interested and people are writing in with requests. There's so much to do, but again, super exciting, great times. Um, looking forward to starting full-time clinical placements after Christmas as well. So thanks very much for watching, guys. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out postgradmedic.com for more free content just like this. Take care, and I will see you next time. Bye.